what are Baha'is actually doing to make the world a better place? Dr. Lincoln, welcome. Thank you. Welcome to another night, another fireside with Dr. Albert Lincoln. We are very happy to have him talk to us about what Baha'is are actually achieving to make the world a better place. I would like to start by reading his bio and then we will welcome him in as more of our participants log in. It's very nice to see everybody. Welcome. As Secretary General of the Baha'i International Community from 1994 to 2013, Dr. Albert Lincoln represented the elected international governing body of the Baha'i faith in international forums and interactions with heads of state and government, diplomats, high officials, and leaders of thought from many parts of the world. Based at the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel, he was also responsible for the management of its host country relations, including dealings with national and municipal authorities, Jewish and Arab community leaders, and organizations of civil society. His efforts to foster harmony and mutual understanding among the various religions, religious communities were recognized by an honorary doctorate conferred by the Uni University of Haifa in 2010 and an award of merit from the city of Haifa in 2013. Before moving to the Holy Land, Dr. Lincoln practiced law for 23 years in France and Africa, serving a clientele comprised of international institutions, embassies, and multinational corporations, as well as local businesses and individuals of many nationalities. His litigation experience included the defense of political and religious dissidents, as well as former officials put on public trial following a change of regime. He was called upon to respond on behalf of the Baha'i international community to serious threats to religious freedom in various parts of Central and West Africa. With that, I would like to welcome Dr. Albert Lincoln to the talk with the title, What are Baha'is actually doing to make the world a better place? Dr. Lincoln, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Alma. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here with you all this evening. Uh, as uh, perhaps mentioned, this is the third in a, in a series of, um, of talks to this gathering. Uh, the earlier ones were what, uh, they're all based on questions. How did the Baha'i faith become a world religion was the first one and back in July. And then why is the world center of the Baha'i faith in Israel? It was discussed in, in August. And now we're talking about what are Baha'is actually doing to make the world a better place? It's a question that we're asked actually quite often. And uh, I hope I hope to uh, to be able to give you some, some elements of an answer at least. Uh, <clears throat> I will not, as they do, these subjects do somewhat build on each other or overlap, but I will not assume that all of you were present or that you remember what I might have said some months ago. Uh, most of you do know that the Baha'i faith is a religion or a spiritual movement with a strong social component and much to say about social justice, race, the environment, and world peace. You're probably also aware that Baha'u'llah, our prophet founder, born just over 200 years ago and a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln, Queen Victoria, Karl Marx, and Sigmund Freud, had a clear vision of a peaceful, just, and prosperous world society that he described as the coming of age of the human race. 
and which he linked to the age-old prophecies about the lion and the lamb lying down together, the building of beating of swords into plowshares, and the knowledge of the Lord covering the earth as the waters of cover the sea. The issue we'll be discussing this evening is what his followers are doing to promote the realization of this vision. In this connection, it's worth remembering that as of today, Baha'is represent less than one per thousand in the world population. The fact that we are dispersed all over the planet and include among us people from just about every nationality, uh, race, and ethnicity is both our main strength and our weakness. As you might expect from people who are so scattered, a great many Baha'is live their faith primarily on an individual basis and work for the betterment of the world through their professions and civic activities and shoulder to shoulder with many like-minded people. But there is more, and this evening I would like to talk about a more strategic approach which blends together a great many individual initiatives with collective efforts of the community as a whole. I will st I'll start with a brief outline of the Baha'i approach to social change. I will then attempt to describe what this looks like in practice, in action after which we'll view a 15-minute documentary, which is a sort of a case study. After getting this view of what it looks like on the ground in reality, we'll conclude with a few visuals with diagrams illustrating the systematic nature of the approach. So the Baha'i approach to social change, its, its most radical aspect is its categorical rejection of contentious strategies as counterproductive. If we aim to bring about peace and unity, our method, methods must be coherent with that goal. Given, history tells us that given enough resources, both human and material, the opposition can be bludgeoned into temporary submission. But there are many examples showing that this is not a viable path to peace and unity. Thus, in a time of polarization and fruitless dis disputation, we're looking for ways to promote positive change without taking sides, because taking sides would only add fuel to the fire. When we think about the problems convulsing our society these days, race, extremes of wealth and poverty, climate change, political polarization and dysfunction, and so on, we see that they have common roots in a culture dominated by materialism, competition, selfishness, and short-sightedness. If we want to treat these root causes rather than simply address the symptoms, effective change must be cultural in nature, starting at the local community level and moving upward in the opposite direction for the political processes that start from the top and work downward. A new culture must be developed based on natural human instincts that are mutualistic, cooperative, and empathetic, so that the power of love becomes stronger than the love of power and the love of possessions. Large segments of the population who are used to being dominated and or manipulated need graduate to learn to think independently, to realize their agency, and to see themselves as protagonists of their own future. This is not something that one group of people can do for another. The dynamic of change must be based on inclusive unity and not on contestation. Uh, it's based on the belief in the fundamental goodness of all people and this, that this is about releasing human potential, inherent human potential, and not imposing a new system or doctrine. We have to struggle with problems and not with people and work towards solutions that are better for everyone. Politics is incapable of doing this because of its competitive and confrontational na nature, and it is unavoidably part of the problem and not part of the solution. This approach necessarily shifts the focus from events and achievements to process. Consultative decision-making, this involves a good key part of that is consultative decision-making 
to which everyone concerned contributes. There's a transparent collective search for solutions that are understood and accepted by and beneficial to everybody. There's a willingness to start with small incremental steps and learn from the results before moving forward. Often it's necessary to protect local processes from undue influence of offers of material assistance, technology and expertise from outside the community. I say undue influence, sometimes these things are good, but often they can be um, uh, essentially delusions. And above all, patience to allow things to progress organically at a pace that reflects the nat natural rhythm of life in that community. So what does this look like in action? Uh, the Baha'i community is engaged in a systematic worldwide process of social change based on transformational community building at the grassroots. The core element is an educational program that's focused on spiritual and humanist humanistic values for children, adults, and uh, children, adolescents, and adults. It's a self-perpetuating system of distance learning at the grassroots level that does not require an administrative structure or physical premises. This educational program equips individuals to serve their local communities <clears throat> and helps them see themselves as protagonists in a collective process of social and cultural change. The dynamic nature of the process feeds sustainable self-generated outreach, growth, and continually deepening impact. Over time, the cultural change spreads organically from individuals to families, then to entire communities, resulting in spontaneous shifts in time-honored practices and conventions. And you'll see this in the, in the case study. The structure and content of this process are inspired by the Baha'i teachings. And we're very open about that because we believe they are the main source of its transformational power. At the same time, everyone involved is welcome to participate in all aspects of the process, to assume positions of leadership and responsibility without ever being under any pressure to become a Baha'i or join the Baha'i community. This is, this is something that we're doing in cooperation with everyone who wants to be part of it. <clears throat> the process I've described is ongoing in thousands of neighborhoods and villages on every continent and nearly all countries. As of April 2019, there were more than 500 communities worldwide with, where over a thousand people were engaged in the educational process and related activities. And this number had more than doubled in the previous three years. 75% of these communities were in Africa and Asia, 15% in North and South America, and about 10% in Australasia and Europe reflecting the distribution of the Baha'i population. Those of you who were at, in attendance for my, my talk about the, um, the Baha'i faith becoming a world religion will remember, perhaps remember a pie graph which showed these, these, the distribution. The number of such, if we come down to our, our, our own continent, the number of such communities, that is those with more than a thousand people engaged in the activities in the United States has grown from 10 in 2017 to 47 as of October, the last published figures. Among the most advanced communities <clears throat> in North America are Toronto and Vancouver in Canada, and San Diego, California, and the Triangle area of North Carolina in the United States. Although the conceptual structure and processes are the same everywhere, the results are more visible and better documented in Africa and Asia, where both the number of communities and the populations involved are larger and more experience has been accumulated. To get a thus, to get a clear idea of the concrete results of this process, uh, I would like to invite you to join me on a short vis virtual visit to a village in India called Bihar Sharif. You won't need your passport or your corona mask. बिहार शरीफ क्लस्टर में 6000 ऐसे लोग होंगे 
जो समुदाय निर्माण में अपना योगदान दे रहे हैं पिछले कुछ साल में लगभग 1000 से ज्यादा किशोर हैं जो किशोर कार्यक्रम से गुजर चुके हैं हमारे किशोर समूह का नाम सत्यवादिता है आज हम सब पर्यावरण के शुद्धता के लिए वृक्षारोपण करने जा रहे हैं लगभग 900 के आसपास में ऐसे बच्चे हैं जो बच्चों के कार्यक्रम से गुजर चुके हैं और लगभग 500 ऐसे व्यस्क हैं जो संस्थान प्रक्रिया से गुजर चुके हैं साठ प्रार्थनाएं सभा को संचालित किया जा रहा है तभी आते हैं और उत्साह के साथ भाग लेते हैं और उनसे प्रेरणा पाते हैं इन सब गतिविधियों की वजह से व्यक्ति की समुदाय और संस्थाओं में गहरा बदलाव आ रहे हैं इस किशोर महोत्सव में आप सभी का स्वागत है हमें आप सभी का स्वागत करते हुए हमें बहुत खुशी हुई किशोर के लिए किशोर महोत्सव बच्चों के लिए बाल महोत्सव इन महोत्सव से समुदाय में काफी उत्साह पैदा होते हैं और जागरूकता भी पैदा होती है किशोर मेला गांव के लिए इसलिए जरूरी है क्योंकि वहां पे हम लोग कुछ सीखेंगे सभी अपना किशोर अपना अनुभव बताते हैं कि हम क्या सीखें पुस्तक में हमारे माता पिता देखकर खुश हुए ऐसी गतिविधि चलती रहे तो हमारे गांव में एकता और प्रेम बढ़ जाएगी हमने एक स्थानीय आध्यात्मिक सभा के संस्थाओं में देखा है कि उन्होंने केवल उन मित्रों के बारे में चिंतित नहीं हैं जो गतिविधियों में भाग लेते हैं बल्कि वो पूरे गांव के मित्रों के कल्याण के प्रति चिंतित हैं जैसे उदाहरण स्वरूप वो ये सोचना प्रारंभ किए हैं कि कैसे हमारे गांव में सभी को आध्यात्मिक शिक्षा मिले हमारा आध्यात्मिक सभा हरगामा और वहाँ के जो है कोऑर्डिनेटर सब मिल के जो है गांव पूरे गांव का जो है सर्वे किया हम लोग डोर टू डोर गए इस हरगामा गांव के पूरे गली मोहल्ले को प्रत्येक वार्ड को हमने जो है सर्वे किया देखें कि हमारे पास कितने युवा युवतियाँ और बैस बच्चे हैं और सर्वे के हिसाब से जो है बच्चा और किशोर और यूथ और उसके लिए जो है क्लास का आयोजन किया गांव का जो है 2000 जनसंख्या है जिसमें 1600 जो है किसी न किसी रूप से जो है हमारे मूल गतिविधि में शामिल होते हैं और आते हैं स्थानीय आध्यात्मिक सभा व अपने गांव के सभी मित्रों के स्वास्थ्य के प्रति भी काफ़ी चिंतित हैं और उन पे उन्होंने चर्चा करना भी प्रारंभ किया है आध्यात्मिक सभा और जो है वहाँ के जो है स्वास्थ्य के प्रति जो है बुजुर्ग आदमी का जो है यहाँ पे कैंप किए थे आई कैंप उसमें हम लोग मिल के और गाँव के लोग मिल के दस बारह गाँव में जो है न्योता दिया था निमंत्रण दिया था कि डॉक्टर आएंगे तो उसमें जो है चार सौ लोग आए थे उनका सफल इलाज हुआ था यहाँ पर कई गाँव को मिलाकर एक पंचायत बनाया जाता है और उस पंचायत का जो मुख्य होते हैं वो पंचायत प्रधान होते हैं वैसे ही एक प्रधान ने सभी पंचायत वासियों को ये प्रोत्साहित करते हैं कि आप सभी अपने युवा किशोर और बच्चे को इन गतिविधियों में शामिल कीजिए है ना मेरे पंचायत में अभी आठ गांव है और अट्ठाईस हजार की आबादी है 
तो उसकी विकास के लिए मैंने बार बार सोचते रहते हैं कि इसलिए जितने भी बच्चे छोटे छोटे हैं उन्हें प्रेरित करते हैं जो मैंने अभी बाहर की तरफ से जो गतिविधि चल रही है इसमें जुड़े रहना चाहिए मेरे घर में दो बच्चे हैं और दोनों बंद लगे सिख तक पहुँच गए और अच्छा चला रही है और हम खुश हैं बच्चे बच्चियाँ हो उसका विकास होगा तो बिल्कुल गांव का विकास होगा और हमारा विकास होगा संस्कृति के स्तर पे बहुत सारे बदलाव आ रहे हैं जिसकी वजह से सदियों से चली आ रही पूर्वाग्रहों से लोग धीरे धीरे मुक्त हो रहे हैं हमारे भारत देश में जाति प्रथा की जो भेदभाव है बहुत गहन रूप से जकड़ रखा है यह एक सामाजिक बनावटी व्यवस्था है उच्च जाति और निम्न जाति के लोग आपस में न घुल मिल पाते हैं न बैठ पाते हैं न बातें कर पाते हैं न साथ में खाना खा पाते हैं जब मैं छोटा था तो मेरे दादा दादी कहते थे कि एक दूसरे जाति का घर नहीं जाना है और उनके यहाँ जाकर खाना उना नहीं खाना है बातचीत नहीं करना है तो लगा ये ठीक है तो फिर रूहीबन और हाउला के पवित्र लेखों को अध्ययन किया और अपने दादा दादी को बताएं जो वो भी एक भाईचारा के रूप में हैं तो उनके घर जाने लगे खाना पीना खाने लगे बातचीत करने लगे और एक दूसरे से मिलने जुलने लगे जिस रूही बन पढ़ने से मेरा अच्छा बहुत दिमाग खुला उसे सीख मिलता है कि जाति प्रथा नहीं हो सकता है समाज अभी देखते हैं तो बहुत खुशी आनंद लगता है पहले जो दुख किसी को भुगतना नहीं पड़ता है पहले लोग बोलते थे कि मैंने अलग अलग जात घर में नहीं आना चाहिए बाहर आना चाहिए दूर भाव करना चाहिए जब स्टडी सर्कल के साथ हम लोग जुटे तो हम लोग के भेदभाव के नाम मिट जाने के लगा और स्वागत करने के लिए हम लोग आमंत्रित रहते हैं अपने बच्चे को प्रवेश करते हुए हम निर्णय लिए कि हमने नहीं बताएं कि किस जाति का है ताकि उसको मन में विचार नहीं आएगा कि वो ऊँचा है या नीचा और ना ही सामने वाले को ऊंची या नीची नज़र से देख पाए सभी को समान नज़र से देख पाए हमारे संस्कृति में व्यस्क और युवाओं के बीच काफ़ी दूरियां थी पहले देखिए जो बुजुर्ग लोग अक्सर हम उन्हें कुछ बोल देते थे तो युवा लोग को मान लेवे पड़ता था लेकिन संस्थान प्रक्रिया आने से काफ़ी बदलाव हुआ अब हम लोग के अवसर मिल रहा है कि एक साथ बैठ करके युवा और बुजुर्ग लोग दोनों मिल परामर्श करते हैं और फिर परामर्श करके ही निर्णय लेते हैं बुजुर्ग लोग जो कर लेते थे निर्णय ले लेते थे वो हो जाता था लेकिन आज जो है जब से ये संस्था आया है तब से दोनों में तालमेल बढ़िया रहता है बुजुर्ग में और बुजुर्गों में और पहले जो था वो आई नहीं है बदलाव बढ़िया हुआ है और बहुत अच्छा लगता है कि महिलाओं को कभी भी निर्णय लेने का अधिकार नहीं दिया जाता है उनकी क्षमताओं को हमेशा कम करके आका जाता है साथ ही एक लड़कियों को बहुत ही कम उम्र में उनकी शादियां कर दिया जाता है वहाँ पे लड़कियों की कोई इच्छा नहीं चलता है वहाँ पर कोई निर्णय लड़कियों से नहीं लिया जाता है कोई परामर्श उनके साथ नहीं किया जाता है हमारे पापा जी जो थे जो कम ही एज में शादी कर दिए थे तो इस तरह से हमें पहले कुछ नहीं महसूस होता था कि शादी क्या है और जब फिर हम यहाँ आए तो देखें कि घर से बाहर नहीं निकलना है हमको मतलब घर के अंदर ही रहना पड़ता था तो कोई आए थे तो बोले कि इस तरह का बुक है आप करना चाहते हैं मेरी सास किसी तरह से तैयार हुई अपना हस्बैंड से भी पूछे तो इस तरह से मैं बुक की पूरे जब से हम इस संस्थान में जुड़ी हूँ हम देखते हैं कि बहुत बदलाव आ रहा है बंधन भी टूट गया है 
यहाँ पर संस्कृति में कि लड़कियों को घर से निकलने के लिए नहीं दिया जाता है हम सिर्फ स्कूल से घर घर से स्कूल जाते थे लेकिन जैसे कि हम संस्थान प्रक्रिया में आए हमें बाहर जाने का मौका मिला पहले शुरू शुरू में हमको डर लगता था कि कैसे हमें अकेले बाहर जाना इतना डर लगता था किसी से बात भी नहीं कर पाते थे फिर भी गए हैं अब हम जूनियर विथ कोऑर्डिनेटर के रूप में सेवा दे रहे हैं हम अपने गांव में भी एक ग्रुप विजिट करते हैं और अलग अलग गांव में भी ये हम जाते हैं वहाँ पर भी ये ग्रुप विजिट करते हैं और हम एनिमेटर के साथ बात करते हैं ग्रुप के बारे में भी और एक दूसरे के साथ मित्रता बन गए हैं यहाँ पर संस्कृति में गार्जियन तय करते हैं कि कौन किससे हम बेटी का शादी हो और लड़की का कौन मर्जी नहीं लिया जाता है गाँव में हम देखते हैं कि लड़कियों को शादी बारह तेरह साल में हो जाता है हमको शादी हुआ था तो हम बारह साल के थे हम पति के कभी देखे थे नहीं हम अपना बेटी के काम उम्र में नहीं करने के लिए सोते थे हमको रिभा बेटी अपना पसंद करने के बाद माता पिता से राय ले ली उसको बाद शादी की है मगर हमारी शादी पच्चीस साल में हुई अभी कुछ दिन पहले ही और हमने अपने सिर्फ पसंद किए अपने गार्जियन को बताए और उन लोगों ने हामी भरी हमारे समाज में लड़कियों को पैदा होने पर जो माँ बाप होते हैं दुखी होते हैं और फिर उसको लिए दहेज इकट्ठा करना उनके पास बहुत कर्ज चढ़ जाता अब दिनों दिनों बहुत काफ़ी तिलक हुआ जा रहा है माता पिता से खेत बाड़ी बेच के भाई कुछ करके काफ़ी दहेज दिया जाता है लड़का के रीवा के शादी में कुछ नहीं कुछ नहीं मांग हुआ है रीवा के साधारण रूप में शादी हुआ हम बहुत माता पिता खुश हैं शादी साधारण तरीके से हुई और हम अपने शादी के दिन ये समीर सलवार पहनी थी जब शिक्षा की बात आती है तो महिलाओं को अक्सर ये कहा जाता है कि ज़्यादा पढ़कर महिलाएं क्या करेगी उन्हें ज़्यादा पढ़ने की क्या आवश्यकता है महिलाओं को हमें आगे आने का अवसर नहीं दिया जाता है और हमेशा से महिलाओं को नाकारा गया है गांव में बहुत लोग मेरी मम्मी पापा को बोलते भी थे नहीं बेटी लोग को इतना पढ़ा के क्या कीजिएगा बस ये तो पापा कभी उन लोग के बात पे उतना ही गौर नहीं किए हमेशा नहीं पर जितना चाहती है ये पढ़ने के लिए उतना पढ़ेगी तो लगा कि नहीं हम शिक्षा हमारे जीवन के लिए बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण है तो हम इस तरह से गुरु के साथ अपने गाँव को देखें कि कैसे हम गाँव को विकसित करने के लिए हम क्या कर सकते हैं हम को बहुत लोग से मिले एक जगह हम लोग बैठक भी किए बहुत लोग अभिभावकों से मिल के सब परामर्श करके किस मतलब समुदाय विद्यालय का स्थापित किए हमारे यहाँ समुदाय स्कूल चार पाँच साल से चल रहे हैं उसमें सौ बच्चे आते हैं पढ़ने के लिए छोटे प्रति नर्सरी से फाइव तक के बच्चे हैं लड़कियों की संख्या काफ़ी बढ़ गई है शिक्षा को लेकर और उनके माता पिता काफ़ी जागरूक हो गए हैं कि हमारे लड़कियां भी अपना पढ़ाई पूरा कर सकें बहला के प्रकटीकरण के जैसे जैसे संपर्क में लोग आना प्रारंभ हुए और जब से संस्थान प्रक्रिया हमारे समुदाय में आया वैसे बहुत सारे जगह हैं जहां पे लोग एक साथ बैठते हैं परामर्श करते हैं और कार्य करते हैं ऐसे स्थान पे कोई भी पूर्वाग्रह की कोई स्थान नहीं है चाहे वो जाति प्रथा की भेदभाव को लेकर हो या फिर स्त्री पुरुष की असमानता को लेकर हो या फिर वयस्क और युवाओं के बीच दूरियाँ को लेकर हो यहाँ पे सभी लोग समान हैं एक साथ बैठते हैं सभी अपने अपने विचारों को व्यक्त करते हैं और सभी एक दूसरों को सम्मान करते हैं हमारे यहाँ एक नई सभ्यता एक नई संस्कृति उत्पन्न हुआ है जो है लोग शिक्षा के प्रति जागरूक हुए हैं ऊंच नीच का जो है भेद कम हुआ है फिर जो है महिलाओं को सम्मान पहले से ज़्यादा मिलता है अब 
लड़कियों का जो है कम उम्र में शादी होना कम हो गया है तो इस तरह से जो है एक नई संस्कृति का जो है चलन हुआ है in this village uh there is a dramatic impact on a, quite a wide range of social issues which are critical crucial to the progress of that community um you know we we heard we heard about uh, child marriage uh restrictions on women on activities of women discri discrimination based on age gender and caste um but i think one of the most interesting things that we saw there it has to do with how the change was taking place uh i referred earlier to the question of doing it without contestation and i hope you you noticed um <clears throat> the comment of the elder on what he could have experienced as a loss of status and his comment was it feels great <laughs> i love it <laughs> uh and think also of the the mother who was talking about the way of ending the caste system by simply not informing her children which caste they belong to now, th these are extraordinary things in the way that they are addressing the problem without um without attacking the pe people um now it it is it is worth remembering that what you've seen there is not a pilot project but an example of really early fruits from a long slow process uh i don't know exactly how long it's been going on in that particular village but i would guess between one and two decades this didn't happen overnight um but the the question is when we think about some of our own social issues like the issue of racism in in north america is this not does this not hold out some hope for how that problem can be solved if the indian if the indian village can deal with caste which has been around for thousands of years uh in in this way through education through understanding through clarity and through conversations um well it it's worth trying uh in our country as well uh as you saw at the end this clip was taken from documentary produced in 2013 and it featured similar visits to Lumumbashi in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Norte de Bolivar in Colombia and Toronto, Canada. The film is called uh, Frontiers of of uh, Learning and it is available on the web and I would warmly recommend watching the the whole of it. Uh I could also share a few stories from Africa where Johnny and I lived for two decades but I think that can wait for the uh the discussion period. Um to conclude my presentation I thought that now that you've seen what it what the process looks like in in human terms it might be useful to um look at some diagrams that show um how the key elements the, the key elements of the systematic approach um where it can fit together uh and to convey this information i'm going to use a few uh a few slides you probably learned some of the vocabulary from the film uh it's called the training institute um the 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 actual materials are produced by something called the ruhi institute and essentially it provides a uh, learning opportunities for all ages children's children junior youth this is a reference to young adolescents from the ages of um basically i think it's 10, um 11 to 15 and then study circles for for youth youth and adults uh the purposes of these courses is to assist individuals to advance on a path of spiritual growth and service to others uh, it's not just about educating the individual by providing insights into spiritual matters imparting knowledge and understanding and developing skills for acts of service um 
the first cycle of the courses. This is a list of the subjects of the courses. I won't go into detail really on that, but you can you can get a sense of how they build on each other. Um, this is sort of a diagram of showing what, in many cases, it looks like there's larger numbers of people going through the first, and, and smaller numbers as it as they move through through the through the sequence. Um, one of the very important things, I mentioned that it doesn't require administrative structures or uh, networks of buildings, is that it's self-perpetuating in that people who have completed book seven are then able to lead the other, lead the group. So people go up through here and then they come back and they can lead other people through through the, the sequence. Um, that's that allows it to be centralizing and decentralized and self-perpetuating. Uh, in fact, taking it a step further, this system produces human resources from a number of different activities. Uh, book five is the, the, the those who lead these junior youth, the 10, 10 to 15 year olds, the teachers for children's classes, CC is children's class, JY is junior youth, uh, are, are trained in book three. Other activities come out of uh, other books, but they're always, they're not just learning for learning's sake, they're always practicing and practices and um, and practical skills involved in in, in each stage. Um, this is sort of a, a list of some of the capacities that are getting developed through this educational process. These are capacities essentially related to working together, working systematically, accompanying each other. This is a term that Baha'is use instead of mentoring because mentoring suggests you know one that one person with more more capable is helping somebody who's less capable. The accompaniment goes both ways and does not uh, and is compatible with an idea of equality and of learning together. Capacity for analysis, strategic planning and management, uh, capacity for learning, overcoming setbacks, very important because things go wrong in all systems and, and being able to recover and move on is extremely important. And, the, and very important in many societies, the capacity for self-expression and, and meaningful conversation, because this is what lifts up the whole, the whole community. Um, over time, a village or an area like Bihar Sharif will progress um, with larger numbers becoming involved as the learning process and these capacities, a few of which I just listed, get um, get developed. And that enables them to pass from one what we call milestones to others, which have to do with the with the numbers of people involved. And earlier when I was talking about the number of communities with over over a thousand people involved, this was the communities that have reached this um, so-called third third milestone. Uh, we try often to think of these, this growth uh, and, and the, the, all these graphs may give the wrong impression, but to think of it really as, as organic patterns of growth because communities really evolve according to their own, at their own pace and according with their own, primarily with their own resources uh, and in their own way and everyone takes, takes a little different look. The, the idea of these squiggly lines was to suggest that, well, uh, the, the communities progress along the same route. They have many different ways that they have their their ups and downs and their challenges and their difficulties along the way. And it is essentially an organic process, even if it's following a common a common path. Now, I thought you just and, and I mentioned some numbers, but I thought you might be interested in seeing what this actually looks like in terms of the United States. You may not be able to read the <coughs> the the um, the key here, but the, um, the the light green is where there are clusters of the first milestone. They're very small. They're just starting out. The darker green uh, is sort of the intermediary level. And then these little red um, red dots that you see in the dark green represent those communities that are already at the level of over a thousand people involved in the activities. 
Uh, so those those are the, the 47 in the United States uh, as of October, and I think this this number continues to grow very quickly. I mean, it's it's almost five times what it was uh, only a few years ago. So uh, I, I'm now just going to go quickly through a couple of the a few of the graphs that I showed in my presentation a few months ago, just to sort of give you an idea of how we got to this stage to be able to do something this in this widespread and involving the kind of human resources that it does and and basically the message here is that that this first period was one of geographical spread around the world i showed some maps and then told some of the stories and what was involved and then from about 1965 to 1985 was a basically a tenfold increase in the number of uh, uh, members of the Baha'i community, uh, and this is this is worldwide. In the United States, it was an eightfold uh, increase in, in roughly that same period. And what was happening at the same time as the increase was a major shift in the uh, ge geographical distribution. By the end of this period, of the 113,000 localities where Baha'is reside, uh, almost 100,000 were in the third world, Africa, uh, Asia, and, uh, and, and Latin America. Um, and the same is true of these elected local governing bodies. Uh, and so that's uh, one of the reasons why three quarters of those uh, communities are in, in, in that part of the world. And this is, this is a comparison of distribution of populations. Obviously, again, I'm as I told you, we're one, about one per thousand in the world, but almost almost as, very similar to that rate in in most in most countries. So this is the Baha'i population, and this is the world population down below, and there are significant differences. Uh, Baha'is are perhaps overrepresented in in uh, North America and Latin, Latin America and Africa, and underrepresented in in Asia, primarily because of China, uh, but Basically, with Africa and Asia is about 75%, as it is 75% of the world population. And the picture to the right is just sort of a visual representation of that, that diversity. We can, despite um, modest numbers, we can claim that we really represent the diversity of, of the peoples of the world. Um, this is the gathering of delegates for electing our national governing body in, the, in 2018. Uh, it's just a bigger version of that of that small picture I just I just showed you. And this is just a, a reminder of again something you've seen, but the the fact that um, the, the 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 younger generations are very definitely represented and actively involved uh, in, uh, in in the community. So that um, really uh, completes what I wanted to, to present. And I would like to now stop sharing my screen and open up here your comments, questions, and whatever. Thank you so much, Dr. Lincoln. Um, that was very, very interesting and informative. I have a few questions for you that I wanted to start off with. Um, one of them is um, it's easy to see uh, this type of growth working in a rural setting, such as the one that we saw, but difficult to imagine changes such as these in an urban setting where most of our audience obviously lives. Could you um, give us an idea of how you can see that progress taking place in an urban uh, setting? Well, it's it's interesting. I think um, uh, Homa, you're you're in in or near Toronto, are you not? Yes. Well, I guess the answer to that is to uh, look up the film and look at the Toronto section. Um, I, I would also point out that in in that map of um, of the United States, uh, most of the clusters that are in this category of over a thousand people involved are actually in cities, all over the country. Larger numbers on the coast, but also cities in in the interior of the country. Uh, 
quite often these this community building activity is focused in not an entire city but in a neighborhood of the city um, and often not the fanciest uh, suburb or neighborhood either um, sometimes the sense of community and the, also the sense of the need for community and for working together is clear and people are, are more receptive to the to the approach um, but I, all I can really tell you is, is it does it does seem to be working in in urban areas as well. Uh, and, and by the way, in the third world, a number of these um, outperforming clusters are in uh, cities. One of the other ones that features in that film is Lumumbashi, which is an enormous city in the Democratic Republic of Congo of the Congo. Uh, so it's not specifically rural. Uh, by by any means. Okay, uh, the next question is, what effect do you think COVID has on this on the progress of this process going forward? So related to the coronavirus and how we have to stay away from each other. Yes, <laughs> interesting. <clears throat> um, yeah, it is certainly in 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 the Western world uh, and those countries outside the Western world that have been heavily impacted by the pandemic. It has <clears throat> obliged us to be more creative in terms of the use of technology. Uh, it's been interesting that uh, at least in this area. Uh, the use of the technology such as that we're using this evening has actually uh, increased the inclusiveness. Uh, people who, been, who are not able to participate in activities because they were housebound, because they were old, because they lived in a remote area, are suddenly can, can do it. Now, on the flip side, of course, there are people who don't have the the bandwidth in a technical sense uh, or the equipment. And uh, so we're, we're finding ways of, of working around that uh, as well. Uh, there are um, ways of meeting outdoors, ways of delivering sort of course materials for the children's classes to the families, to getting the parents of the children more involved in the spiritual education of their kids, which is basically a good thing. Uh, so yes, difficulties, but also difficulties that are obliging us to be more more inventive. Uh, but the, the, certainly the process hasn't stopped or been significantly uh, crippled by any means. And thank, and I must say, thank God that Africa, most of Africa so far has been been spared the rigors they've had every other kind of catastrophe. But um, this one, uh, I was looking at a graph this morning showing that um, that Africa's really hardly been touched by this, this pandemic. It's a younger population. And I don't know what all the reasons are, except maybe they just have been spared because they've had everything else. Wonderful. That's, that's good to know. Uh, another question. Um, how is this new system, I think it's referring to the Institute process, how is this new system incorporated into the Baha'i faith related to the mystical and spiritual nature of the faith? Well, yeah, that, I mean, that's an interesting question. I, uh, I've, I'll take a stab at it and then some, whoever asked it can come back with, with more if I, if I missed the point. Um, <clears throat> In, in a sense, because of the, the fact that this is open to everyone and it's about collaboration uh, and that the mystical side of the faith, even the what you might call the religious side of it, is a question of personal choice um, and, and which we, we you know, because of teachings that are part of the faith, we are very careful not to invade on, on individual choices in this matter. So it means to some extent that the, the uh, 
community building process that I've been talking about this evening are, well, they're still funded on and founded on the social aspects of the teachings, which are coherent with the spiritual teachings. Nonetheless, the spiritual teachings are separate in the sense that that they are only for people when they, when they want them and when they choose them. Uh, and essentially what what people who are collaborating with us in this undertaking and 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 we're talking about you know and in many cases more than a majority of the people involved in these activities uh, is that they are basically willing to learn about and promote the vision of the future that is found in the Baha'i faith, but is also not by any means limited to the Baha'i faith, is something that basically many people share and have no difficulty in collaborating with us, even though they may remain Muslims or Christians or or whatever. And that's, and that's fine from the point of view of this process. This is not a missionary process. This is a community building process. Okay, um, I have another question here. Uh, I have heard other stats from other sources, uh, non-Baha'i sources, reporting Baha'i world population closer to seven to eight million. Do we know what number is more accurate? <laughs> um, I, I'm familiar with those sources. Um, and there's a, recently a, a, an article produced by one of those scholars who has, has his research leads him to the conclusion that the Baha'i faith is actually the only religion that has grown consistently in all of the regions defined by the United Nations over the last hundred years. Um, but to get back to you, to the question, um, with matters of religious demographics, there's a serious question about what you're counting. And, and of course, how you count it. Um, there, it's one thing when you count um, card-carrying enrolled members of a congregation or religion, uh, community, whatever. And another when you count the number of people involved in, 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 in activities sponsored by that uh, community. Um, Another way is, is to ask, is to look at census data uh, because many people identify with a religion without ever having been officially enrolled in it. Um, so it really depends a lot on what you count and how you count it. And, um, and this may be one of the reasons, I, I think it probably is one of the reasons why um, they, <clears throat> behind, um, international authorities have not released recent figures about the numbers because I think it's it's not clear what what they would mean. Um, we also know that, that there are significant communities in certain countries where the Baha'i faith is not recognized and where it would be provocative to publish <laughs> Mm -hmm. The fact that, that there are such communities. Right. So for various reasons that we don't have current statistics that that anybody can really rely on. I, I think that the the estimate or the numbers that you that your question has referred to are plausible, but I, I must say I don't know exactly what they've counted or how they've counted. I think it's sort of a hybrid of different methods and, and this is an, a way of estimating. Um, and I, I think it's it's good information, but not but, but it doesn't give us the whole picture. Okay, so uh, related to that, uh, when you say the Baha'i community, uh, do you not mean sorry? When you say the Baha'i community and. Uh, and community building, you are not talking about the Baha'i community then. You are talking outside of the Baha'i community. Is that correct? So right. uh, that is the part of the question. And what what are the prerequisites for the membership of into the Baha'i community? Or uh, and how has that changed over the years? Hmm. 
Well, I think, um, let's see. The, let me sort of clarify first that when I use the term the, the Baha'i community, that would refer to those who are enrolled and who participate in such things as uh, the election of the leadership, who are contributing to the funds. And for that, you have to be an enrolled Baha'i. When I talk about community building, uh, particularly in the context we're talking about tonight, this is a collaborative effort with many other people who are part of it because they choose to be part of it and, and who do not feel that they have to become Baha'is or, or to obey Baha'i laws or, and they're not allowed to contribute to Baha'i funds. So there, there is, there's a distinction. So that's why I use the term uh, collaborative. Uh, because it's an agreement to work together towards essentially social ends, uh, but but also with some of these the, the the strategies and the goals and the the values being those that that are part of the of the um, of, of the Baha'i teachings. Um, so let's see now. This. There was another part of the question. Oh, so how, have, how has the criteria changed oh. uh, over the years for membership? Okay. The criteria for enrolled membership has not changed that substantially. Uh, what has changed is the recognition that it's a mistake to make too much of the, of the difference, of the distinction, that the what's often referred to as the wider society or the wider community, uh, we, we don't need sharp distinctions and, and lines between who is and who isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, because we're all working together and because the questions of, of, the, sort of the spiritual side of it are individual. Um, so, uh, it, you know, there's been a, 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 a blurring or a softening of those lines and those distinctions. And, um, and that has brought about a significant change. I and mean, there was a time when the Baha'i community seemed to be turning inward too much and, and getting sort of isolated and everybody was, you know, was talking in their own ling a certain lingo and uh, adopted customs and we drank Persian tea. and. Uh, and but but I think but it was realized that that was not that that was really basically contradictory with so much that's in the spirit of the Baha'i faith that we needed to be more open, more engaged with the society around us, and also to to share what insights uh, the Baha'i teachings give us about social issues and social problems and how to attack them. Okay, uh, I have another uh, audience member asking about um, the space within the Baha'i community to change uh, and reconsider the terms we use. I think this person is referring to the words third world such that you used in your description at one part of your speech and so on because it is it stems from a western um, point of view of domination and so on um, if you could address that please I accept the criticism. That's fine. <laughs> I don't think it was meant as criticism. No, Perhaps no. if we can talk about how we can yeah. engage in the new vocabularies. Yeah. Well, I, I think that one of the one of the ways we do that is by listening and taking taking account of, of, of such such points. Occasionally, we I I speak for myself. Occasionally, I, I find myself using terminology without thinking about where it came from. Um, and uh, I tried mostly to speak about the continents by their name rather than by category. Uh, but no, good point. And uh, let let us let us you know go on learning from each other in that in that regard and and making our our uh, terminology more 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 accurate and and less less loaded. Uh, and absolutely the need to um, overcome this assumption of Western superiority, dominance, and all that is, is extremely important and a, and a battle that we're all fighting. And, and 
in that regard, I must say that um, one of the fascinating things that's happening now is that the communities of India and Africa and South America are actually leading the world in terms of uh, putting these systems into practice and learning how they work. And, um, you know, I mentioned that there are um, what, uh, 15 percent of the uh, communities of uh, the community building processes of more than a thousand participants in North America and Europe compared to 75 percent in Asia and Africa. And, and uh, that's why we you know, went to India to have a, have a look at what it looked like. Uh, and these, the, the, the 40, 50 we have in, in North America are basically learning from their African brothers and sisters about how to do it. And um, this is a very interesting reversal of roles. <laughs> and, and, and I think a very salutary one. So true. So true. I have uh, two questions um, that I think might be a little bit related. One is, and you can choose uh, the order with which you answer them. Could you share some of your own experiences in changes of culture that occurred around you? Um, I think you, you mentioned some stories from Africa uh, that you might want to recount. And the second question is, um, how did your role as Secretary General and the interactions you had with heads of state and other officials allow you to share these community building ideas? Is this as important as the grassroots movement taking place in cities and villages? Mm -hmm. So they're both about your experience, whichever one you would like to go first. Well, I think I'll start with the second one because I can pass it off. Um, in, in many ways, this process that um, I've been talking about tonight was, was really just getting started during the years uh, when I was in Haifa. And uh, I was so busy dealing with, the, with uh, those characters and, and other things related to the... Um, the um, Post country relationships that, that I was, you know, a bit behind the process and learning about what was going on. And that's, I've become much more aware of it having left there. So, that being the case, I think it's, it's a question for my um, the successors, and particularly the one who is there now, um, David Redstein, from uh, who's a, a resident, normally a resident in Elliott, Maine, uh, here near Greenacre. Um, about the the changes again, my the, the time that we <clears throat> that we spent in Africa was pretty early on in the 1970s and 80s. Um, my wife Joni, who's present here, I had the opportunity to visit uh, from the Holy Land in the 1990s and and uh, 2000s, and and was able to go to places like Mumbashi and. Uh, other parts, other <clears throat> other parts of Africa. I also saw some of the development of these uh, community building in, in places like Australia, which were also forging ahead. Um, so again, my what I I can speak to the early stages where um, there were already significant changes. Uh, the the fact of not having a clergy was a radical change in the African community's experience of religion. And the, the notion that the responsibility was on the individual believer and that the community would be organized by elected um, institutions at the local and national level uh, was, was really re quite revolutionary. And, and um, this notion of um, agency and of seeing oneself as a protagonist and not just a member of a flock to be led, uh, you, you, could, you could see this developing 
uh, throughout, and it, and it's a, uh, the the I'm thinking particularly of the Central African Republic, which is the place we were from 1972 to 19, the end of 1982, um, and which because of the troubles and difficulties in the country, um, about there there have now been no no foreigners in that. Uh, in, 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 in the Baha'i community uh, in that country for a couple of decades. And the Central Africans have taken over the responsibility, have done an extraordinary job of building up the community, have uh, actually led the world in the development of these community schools. You heard the reference in the, um, uh, in, in the film to community schools. Well, this was basically an idea originated and developed in the Central African Republic, which has, I don't remember the right name, but something like 20 to 30 of these schools around the, uh, around the country. These are schools which are owned and built, and I don't mean buildings, I mean the schools themselves, by the parents of the kids. Um, if, there's a, if there's a school, some sort of a shelter, they, they build it. Uh, the uh, teacher is usually someone, a young, younger person recruited in the community who is supported by the community. If they can't pay them a salary, they pay them in yams and potatoes, yams and, and manioc or whatever it is that, that, uh, that they grow in that community. Uh, and when the uh, national uh, system of, of education broke down, during rebellions and unrest and so on, these were the only schools in the entire country outside the capital which continued to function. And the people in the Ministry of Education that used to make fun of it, saying, oh, what, you know, what kind of a school is this? There's no building, there's no bathrooms, there's no, you know, no football field, <laughs> uh, said, oh my goodness, <laughs> it's working. <laughs> Kids are getting educated. Um, Anyway, that uh, that's only a partial answer to your to your question, but um, hopefully it's some help. Certainly, um, I was hoping you would get into some of your stories also after this one. Um, uh, our one of our members of our audience, when we lived in Egypt in the 1980s, Joan's pioneer song lifted us up. <laughs> Can you talk about how music and arts used in the Ruhi Institute pros? Uh, proposes, sorry, helps with the growth of the program. And if you would like to uh, um, have uh, Joni volunteer as well to, to speak with you, you, she's more than welcome. Well, she, she's more qualified than I. Um, <laughs> would, would you like to, Joni? Hi. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you very welcome. much. Welcome. Welcome to the group. So many wonderful people on here, and the questions are excellent. Uh, I keep thinking I should send the message into the other room and say, Albert, you should say this and remember that story and remember, but we're in different rooms here. <laughs> so I think. I'll um, hear about all those things later, what I didn't say. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, we are in different rooms as well. So I'm going to have Homa telling me what was wrong before you you talk to Lincoln. <laughs> okay, go on. Uh, go I'm very happy to have you here. Please go on. Uh, thank you. My connection is telling me I'm unstable. So perhaps if something happens, um, I can you can still hear me. Um, one of the fascinating things I found when we arrived in Africa was how musical the people were their whole life, the, their weekends, all, all weekend long, all night long, people danced. The drums were all around our house the whole, the whole night long. And the Baha'i friends, I had a few songs I was bringing. They came from either Paris or United States. We translated them and everything. So we brought along these old songs, but my goodness as soon as people knew that singing was just going to be just fine whoo, they were off with all their songs they must have produced more songs you know in a couple of years and and i saw 
in my own experience in Europe or, or United States. The wonderful thing was they used music to memorize the Baha'i writings. Mm. That was the way they do it. And this helped the older people because remember at this time when we were there, the first country, second country also really, uh, older people couldn't read. And the younger people were starting to read. And that was one of the fascinating things that they were talking about in India. We saw that also, where there used to be such a discrepancy between the older generations and the younger, but all of a sudden it was the younger ones who could really study and read and memorize. And this became a fascinating transition to watch. So um, on one of my trips back into Africa, Africa, since we had 20 years of living there, and then I had 20 years of travel from the Holy Land, uh, we were in the, I was in the city of Bukavu. This is a city in the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is simply an illustration. And we had a fascinating consultations all about what were they doing with their study circles and how are they setting up their institute and how are they training their tutors and et cetera, et cetera. And on the Sunday, I remember they said, well, our junior youth are going to come and sing to us now. So we all thought, oh, that's great. We'll have a break. And so these, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, these kids all came in and began singing. Well, once they start singing, guess what? That went on for a good 20 minutes <laughs> because they just go from one song to another song to another song. And uh, my translator said to me, um, Madame Lincoln, est-ce que vous voulez que je traduise pour vous? Would you like me to translate for you? Why? Because they were in the local language. And I said, yes, I don't actually know what they're saying. And he said, this song is one of their new ones. They, have tra they are singing the first paragraph of a letter from the Universal House of Justice. My goodness. <laughs> that was a description of the beautiful shrine of the Bab that had been renovated. And that year, uh, the message from the House of Justice came describing what it was like now um, on, the, on the Mount Carmel and looking out over the Mediterranean and everything. Those junior youth had word for word taken that message and put it into a song. So, I mean, this is simply an illustration. Another time I was traveling way out in the western part of the Ivory Coast. You know, there was a huge war, civil war between Liberia in Liberia. Maybe you remember way back there. Yeah. And so um, a whole pile of Liberians all came over the border fleeing Liberia and settled in the, in the Ivory Coast. And they just brought their local assemblies with them. And they started up all their activities. So some of us drove out to visit them and see what, that, what was going on out there. And um, that one night they were around the fire. They wanted me to tell them stories. Oh, Lord, about the history of the faith. I'm not very good, but I was able to think of a few stories that I wanted to tell them. So I started to tell them about the Black Pit. The Black Pit, for people who don't know it, is the name of the underground prison in which they kept Baha'u'llah. Terrible place. So I began describing about the Black Pit pit, how the people were chained together, and yet how they would sing. Even though they called somebody out every day to be killed, they would sing. And so all of a sudden, the meeting broke up. The people all jumped up, and they started dancing around the fire and singing. And I thought, oh, oh my Lord, Jonah, you've, you've lost them. You know, they, you, you, something went wrong here. And so I said to my translator, what, what's going on? He said, oh, Madame Lincoln, ils sont en train de chanter on the, about the black pit. They've made up a song all about the black pit and they're dancing and dancing and singing all about it and what the people did. I thought, oh my Lord, what a way. This is another illustration of the use of the arts and then how it goes right to their hearts. So then they sat down a little bit and then I thought of another story was about the red roan. 
At least I could tell them how Baha'u'llah left the Garden of Rizwan, how on the Red Roan, et cetera, et cetera. So I was doing my best to remember the details. Same thing. Bah, they all jumped up. Oh, they started singing and dancing. This time, at least I knew. They were singing about the Red Roan, about the man who threw himself down in front of Baha'u'llah's horse because he would rather be trampled upon than be separated from the blessed beauty. I hope I'm on the subject, friends, but this is just an illustration of absolute passionate devotion to the teachings of the faith, to translating it into their own languages, into their own culture, and moving. So the, when you think about this and the drama and the love that's behind all of it, it is a very important question, whoever asked it, because this pushes those friends like crazy. They fall in love with this. It becomes theirs. They carry the letters of the House of Justice in their back pockets. This is real life. Do you think I said enough? Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Albert Lincoln, would you like to add anything to that uh, wonderful answer from your wife? Well, I'll just, I'll just maybe address that part of it which related to the uh, educational process of the Institute <clears throat> because it, the arts are definitely part of that because they relate to people's creativity, they relate to, to very closely to spirituality. And the, the notion is also that one of the things that, one of the uh, ways that we perceive um, spiritual things is through the natural attraction to beauty. Um, so th this, you know, well, well, there's no way to kind of formulate that into a, a, a method exactly, but when people have an opportunity to develop and release their creativity, it, it brings out, well, the, the the other half of the brain <laughs> uh, gets everybody in, in, involved where you're not, it's not just all um, left brain logic and stuff, but it but gets the, the fuller human being engaged in, in the process. So uh, I think that that's really what your questioner was, was asking and, and that it is an integral part of that, of that learning. And of course, it's also, you know, you can see that some people have a learning style that is essentially based on that creativity in arts and crafts and not on, you know, listening to long talks like uh, you've just been putting up to up with <laughs> and taking notes and all that sort of thing, getting ready for the exam. But but it, but it's, it's a more natural and integrative way of absorbing material like the... Um, like the people in Joni's stories, where they were the the way they were going to remember that story was by making it into a song, and that that was the way they were going to absorb the significance of it. The same with the with those junior youth who were who made the song out of the message from the Universal House of Justice. Wonderful, thank you. So I think that also answered. The second question about your personal experiences uh, in Africa. Uh, the person who asked the question about um, the music also mentioned that it's uh, in book seven of the Ruhi program, part three. I think she's talking about the mention of yeah. um, how the arts uh, elevate our experiences. Yeah. Um, uh, just, just add that in case we don't remember the, the diagram, Book seven is the one that trains the people to to tutor or accompany the other the groups through the other books. So it's part of the tra the training of those people is how to bring in the arts to the to the whole process. Sorry, not at all. Um, we we only have about ten minutes left. One other question that I have for you is: you mentioned. Uh, the difference in the Baha'i way of thinking of mentorship that today we call it accompaniment. Mm. Uh, could you talk a little bit further about how Baha'is regard uh, this type of um, accompaniment and what you think this means for our development today? 
Well, you again, if you, if you remember one of the diagrams that was talking about, no, it wasn't a diagram, it was a list about the capacities that were being learned. It referred to the art of accompaniment. And I think this is because it's, it's not a simple uh, thing that you can write a manual about. It, it, it's a, just a different approach, which is um, really comes from passages in the Baha'i writings that say that somebody who's in a role of educating should not think of themselves as superior and should not be just transferring knowledge into, a, into, a, into an empty receptacle, but that what really makes, makes a difference is when um, someone is accompanied in this sense that, that you're walking with them, you're sharing what they're learning and what you are learning or have learned, uh, you're encouraging them when the going gets gets steep and difficult, and, and letting them help you when you need help. Um, and that this is just a very different kind of relationship, which in, in the long run is much more conducive to building capacity and empowering other people, and in building capacity throughout the community, and and specifically. Uh, encouraging and nurturing um, uh, other people to, to move into the arena of action. And I, I think it's probably something that mothers have always known. <laughs> um, and maybe some, dad, some fathers have, have got to have understood also that, that, that it's a different, it's a different, it's a different mental model than the teacher, student, master, pupil, mentor, mentee, um, trainer, trainee, which is so, so prevalent all through our, our culture. Thank you. But, but we are still learning <laughs> and will be for some time. Yes. Thank you for that. One more question uh, is regarding, again, the community building. When we say that in community building, we are talking about outside of the Baha'i community. How do we then bridge that community that has been built outside of the Baha'i community with the Baha'i community? How do we incorporate those on the outside to with the Baha'i community that is hopefully growing along alongside it, but parallel to it? Yeah. Well, I, I would I would start with the I think the concept of collaboration, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's not outside of the Baha'i community, um, and neither is the Baha'i community outside of the, lar the larger community. They are really in, in the same space. Um, now, the um, I think that there there is of course a this distinction, there are, as, as I mentioned, certain processes that or certain things that only enrolled Baha'is <coughs> can do, like contributing to the Baha'i funds or like voting in Baha'i elections and so on. Um, but the institution which Baha'is elect, the local spiritual assembly, again, I'll refer to the film that we saw, had what assumes at a certain point a, a role in, in the community in the wider community. In that case, it was not displacing the, the chief who was happy to have them have the spiritual assembly take care of some of the things that he didn't have time for. Um, but it nonetheless is there for anyone to, to turn to. And one of the things that we see happening in these communities is that, is that people are bringing their problems to the spiritual assembly, and, and I'm talking about people who are not mem not Baha'is, not members of the Baha'i community, nonetheless hear about this consultative body and how it deals with issues, and they they bring their issues to that to the assembly for advice. Now, the assembly would give advice, but not uh, uh, based on you know you, you should apply these Baha'i laws because they're not applicable. But rather, uh, you know, here are some 
counsel about how you might resolve this problem, but it's really up to you. Um, so I, I think that what I'm saying here is that what that requires some um, careful distinctions about what what applies where. Uh, the, the the Baha'i laws apply to those who are Baha'is. Uh, the those who are are not and are collaborating in the process have many of the benefits without the obligations. Um, and that's and that's fine, uh, but but we'd have to be mindful of, you know, where where, <laughs> where people are at and where, how how to apply these things in in, in the in the appropriate way. And and again, I, I'm sure that that is also a subject of some learning. And I'm probably lots of mistakes are made, and that's how we how we learn and get it better. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lincoln, I'd like to close here now, unless anybody has a final question. I wanted to also thank Joni Lincoln for joining us. That was a very lovely impromptu part of this evening. Thank you so much to you both. And uh, just as a reminder, this Fireside and many others are available on firesidebahai.org. Uh, as soon as they are edited and put together, they appear on the site. And so you can share them with as many of your friends as you'd like, or rewatch a section and ask further questions um, if you if you find them. Uh, and so I would like to thank you both again and welcome to everyone and see you next time. Thank you so much.